everyone. Welcome to Audio Judo. This may be the saddest episode ever it could, of Audio Judo. It could very well be. Thus far, for sure. Yes, of the amount that we've done up to now, this will probably be the saddest. I'm Kyle. I'm Matthew. And welcome to Audio Judo. Thank you for joining us. Today we are talking about an album by a folk artist from Britain in the early 70s named Nick Drake. And his album was Pink Moon, which is a sad record. God, so sad. And it gets sadder when you know the backstory behind yes. it. Plenty of backstory for Nick Drake. A little background on how it came across this record. So 1999-2000, it appeared in a Volkswagen ad yeah. for a Cabrio, I believe. Um, I did not hear it that I can recall then. Um, I had moved back from Colorado with my family to Michigan, and one of my very good friends came out to visit me, and he, we were audiophiles together. We used to go to record conventions. We used to go to concerts together right out of high school, and he came up to visit me with a giant stack of these homemade CDs of all this music that he had been listening to that he wanted me to uh, join in with. Uh, he had some stuff from Elbow, and he had uh, Helium, like really kind of different stuff. And then he had this CD that I was trying to find by Nick Drake that it was a mix of all of Nick Drake's three albums. So okay. Five Leaves Left, Brighter Later, and Pink Moon. And I listened to it, and he had labeled it uh, the world's greatest lullabyist. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. I got three little boys. You know, yeah. This would be great. Uh, and it started with a, a song from uh, Brighter Later called the Chime of the City Clock. And it was really lush arrangements very orchestral arrangements strings horns little limited guitar and this really smoky almost unintelligible voice really not able to understand his lyrics but it was beautiful but it just it didn't connect with me until from the morning from pink moon came on and there was this immediate attachment to the album like right away and i hate to use the word haunting but it certainly had that stark beauty that you immediately gravitated to. So I wanted more of that. So I asked him if I could, if he could give me the whole record since he had it. And so he put it on CD and I listened to it and it's 28 minutes of just, yeah, it's hard to listen to when you do know his backstory. Yeah. Well, and I don't really want to blow the ending here, but really it is a 28 minute long suicide note. I mean, it very much is. I hate to say that because it's it's sad and it's depressing, but that is it is true. It's it is very much a you can tell that he was especially when you listen to all three albums because the first two are very orchestral, they're very much more upbeat, and then this slows down and it's just him. I don't know about upbeat, right. No, it but, is. It, there's some there's some joyfulness in those records, and I can't tell if it was artificially created. Yeah that that wasn't his voice speaking necessarily like he wrote the songs but i doubt that he had much input on the arrangements for yeah. it, especially when you know that pink moon is one guitar mm -hmm. one voice and one track that has a slight piano overdub and mm -hmm. that is it so and recorded in two nights two right? nights yep he just showed up at the studio of his label he wanted to uh Wanted to put some tracks down, so the the daytime uh, studio time was booked. So he came at like eleven o'clock at night and recorded over a two night period these eleven unreal yeah. tracks with very poetic yet desperate, desperate for attention, desperate for communication. He's so Nick Drake, born in England, he grew up uh, affluent middle class household. Went to his Cambridge. Father was an engineer. Yeah, uh, in he, India for several yes. years before they moved back to England. Right. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and he, you know, got involved <laughs> with uh, with the school kids like you would, smoking a lot of dope and doing those things. And and he had a knack for playing the guitar. But he was your he's your classic loner. These interviews that I read, it, he would just sit in the corner during a party and strum his guitar and very introverted. Yeah. You know. He had no really close relationships to speak of, no intimate relationships to anyone's knowledge. Like biographers haven't been able to confirm any of that. Yeah. So. Well, I remember I found a, a quote from his father talking about how uh, I, I should have written the exact quote down. And 
I didn't stupidly, but and I probably won't be able to find it very quickly here. But uh, his father uh, got a note from uh, his headmaster, and it said, um, "You know, Nick is a, a great kid. He he was on the rugby team at the time, and he mm-hmm. said, you know, everybody knows him from rugby, and and lots of people know him, but nobody really knows him. Mm. He's very he's not open. He's very quiet. He doesn't uh, doesn't talk to a lot of people outside of." sports and things. And even like you said, uh, you know, he, he worked his way away from sports as he got more and more and more interested in music. Mm-hmm. He, he basically completely turned his back on athletics and, you know, anything really social and focused entirely on music. In fact, there's a, I think it was, was it five leaves that he, when they were recording it, he started skipping college mm-hmm. to go to the recording sessions. Instead, he started skipping his classes because he's like, I enjoy this so much more. Right. And, and enjoy with him seems to be like, I don't know how much he enjoyed it. Yeah. Cause he didn't enjoy giving interviews or doing publicity or touring. Yeah. He went on tour briefly and realized how much he hated it because people weren't paying attention necessarily. They were, you know, getting a drink at the bar and not listening to what he was doing. Yeah. And he, that I think he felt jilted by that. And, you know, in a bunch of the research, someone said it's like uh, trying to shape a picture of him is like watching a figure behind a screen of smoke. Sometimes he's there and sometimes he seems hardly to have existed at all. Mm, and it's just beautiful, just very kind of ethereal. Like it, you, you're not sure like what kind of person this really was. So the the friend um, who gave me the record, mm-hmm. uh, his name was Chris Delisle. So. I'm st- I still talk to him pretty often. And I said, Hey, Chris, I'm doing this episode on Pink Mood. Can you just write me up something, just your f- thoughts and feelings about it? So I might reference it a few times while, while we're talking about it, since he has a more broader knowledge of, of that since he's been listening yeah. to it longer. So one of the first things he wrote, and by the way, thanks again, Chris, for this. I appreciate it. He said, The music on Pink Moon is immediate and intimate. Each song is uniformly excellent and seemingly effortless. The sound of the recording provides a portal into the early 1970s, creating a world to escape to and a sound to hide in. The clean and clear mix of Drake's lone hypnotic guitar juxtaposes with the smoky sound of his voice, issuing forth lyrics both simple and cryptic. And like you couldn't put a better synopsis on what that record was. Yeah. Than that's that. fantastic. Right. And I researching a bunch of it, but like, multiple times came across references to his guitar tone, you know, lone hypnotic guitar, clean and clear mix. Everything I saw was crystal clear. And I'm like, okay, I should listen to some other stuff to see how that holds up, Mm -hmm. especially from that era. And it is completely different. I don't know if it's the way he picks the guitar. I don't know if it's the mix specifically, but there is a brightness yet loneliness. uh, so, So I don't know if he was recording it in a huge room and just in the center and all you, it's just all you're getting is guitar, but it's so perfect for that record. I do know, I, I remember reading somewhere that uh, he had specifically said that when they were recording um, the first two albums, his guitar on those, he had said, I want, I don't want it to sound like pop music. I don't want it to sound, I want the guitar to come through really strongly. And I think that that probably had a lot to do with it. He didn't want uh, that reverb. He didn't want any of the the hesitate to call it processing because it was the early 1970s but he didn't want any of that process sound on it and on pink moon i think that he he went even farther i think that it was literally just an acoustic guitar being picked up by a mic i don't even think it was plugged in i think it was just the guitar and the mic yeah there's certainly like no no effects to speak of uh, nothing like that this is such a weird album for me too because i listened to it for years Mm -hmm. before i knew any of the backstory and I, I found it in a really weird way too. In the like, really, this would have been like ninety eight or ninety nine, pre Napster. Mm-hmm. The way that I used to get music off the internet was this process called skimming, where a bunch of people would share music on FTP sites, just dump a bunch of MP3s into a folder, and it was basically open to the internet. The thing was, you had to know where it was in order to find it. Well, there were little tricks you could use with search engines of the time to find those open sites Mm -hmm. and then you could go on and it would be somebody's whole music collection and you could just sit there and download, 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 download. Really? And presumably those people would be like, why the hell is my internet running so slow? (laughs) 
but uh you know that's how i got a lot of music in the in the really early days of uh pre you know because your other option was to go to like whereas like porn sites that were basically like it was porn and music those were the two things you could download and it was a crapshoot when you download the music because you'd be like this doesn't look like a music file let's see what happens when we open it <laughs> oh nope, no that's porn <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I would skim a whole bunch of uh, 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 people's FTP sites and download their music. Okay. And I remember finding this guy who had a, a computer running that had a whole bunch of whole bunch of music on it. I mean, at the time, we're talking gigabytes worth of music, mm -hmm. more than I could possibly ever download. But at the time, I had been listening to a whole bunch of uh, like 60s, kind of like folk music, uh, you know, Donovan, Donovan, mm -hmm. um, a little bit of Van Morrison. Uh, Stuff like that. And I remember finding this album and it didn't actually have Nick Drake as the artist. Mm. It was just because at the time, you know, people didn't put ID3 tags on stuff. They weren't doing any of that. It was, you could tell it had been uh, copied off of an album, like an actual vinyl album, because you could hear the pops and clicks and stuff in the recording. And I remember listening to it and being like, wow, this is really sad. And it was backwards. The tracks were all listed, so the B side had gotten recorded first, and then the A side. So it was out of order. So Pink Moon was right in the middle of it. Okay. And I remember being like, "Well, wow, it's kind of a weird order, and it doesn't really, you know, it didn't make a lot of sense to me, and I didn't know who the artist was for years. Mm -hmm. And then I remember uh, hearing it on that Volkswagen commercial that you mentioned. I remember hearing it there and being like, oh, I wonder if I should start, like, trying to figure out who this is, because that was kind of an in, because... You couldn't just type song lyrics into the internet at that point. You know, there wasn't. How did people live? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, my other option would have been to like call a radio station and sing it or play it through the phone or, you know, I, I had no idea how to figure it out, but I ended up using that Volkswagen commercial to kind of act as a, a jumping off point mm -hmm. to be like, who is that? Who is singing that song in the Volkswagen commercial? And they're like, oh, it's Nick Drake. And it's like, oh, all right. Now this all makes sense. This mm -hmm. is the album and I started looking it up and it's like, Oh no, I've been listening to it out of order for all these years. And so I finally got a much better copy of it mm -hmm. and started listening to it. And it kind of lived in my rotation for a while. And then it kind of went away until, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and I just remember listening to it one day and being like, I wonder if you made anything else and starting to like, look him up and be like, Oh, okay. This, oh, mm -hmm. Oh, right. this is very sad. This is very depressing. <laughs> right. Those three records basically sold i want to say maybe while he was alive combined maybe 15 maybe 20,000 copies oh i'll bet not even that much of of three records these these three standalone these beautiful records and he was despondent especially after the first two did nothing he he, he disappeared basically went back to live with his parents moved around quite a bit he had a stay in a psychiatric ward he smoked a lot of hash, smoked a lot of weed. As you do. As you depressed. do back then. And he was troubled. Whether that's bipolar, whether that's clinical depression, whatever it is, he was despondent. And, you know, I've heard quotes about him. You know, Drake simply faded away, a victim not of excess, but of some deep, profound unhappiness. And that really sums up this, uh, who he was. And, you know, People talk about that an air of fragility that hung over all of his work, like this very fragile state that he was in all the time uh, in between Brighter Later and Pink Moon. As the story goes, he had done nothing for months, maybe maybe a year or so, and has the bug to record these records. And then he shows up at Island Records Studios with the masters in, a, in either a bag or a box. And there's like some mythology on this story that that he just dumped it on the the yeah. counter and walked out. Uh, more of the reality is uh, the CEO of of the record company said, "Hey, Nick, good to see you. You know, you should come upstairs and and hang out." And they went up and hung out, and Nick kind of just sat in the chair for a long time, and then got up and left. And on his way out, he had just kind of deposited the records at the desk that said pink moon masters on it basically and they're like oh what's this and my friend wrote you know very specifically he said uh the problem was you know the the dichotomy of being told he was a genius because they had 
yet not being able to sell his music sent an already too sensitive for this world artist back home to, into a place he did not want to live, but the only place he could survive. He recorded an album Island Records did not know existed, nor did they want, but upon hearing Pink Moon released it anyway. Again, this super depressed, yeah. tortured genius who clearly had a gift and was unable to communicate how and how much trouble he was in mentally. And the only way he could communicate that was through this record that didn't sell and probably reinforced yeah. that that depression that he was in. One of my favorite quotes from this whole thing is uh, an advertisement for the album in Melody Maker in February of 1972 opened with Pink Moon, Nick Drake's latest album. The first we heard of it was when it was finished. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. Right. Right. If, if you take this record as a whole. So there's no indication that he knew spiritually what a Pink Moon was. Hmm. So Pink Moon in uh, Native American folklore uh, signifies rebirth and renewal. I said, uh, after a long, cold, gray, miserable winter, the resurgence of the color pink is a sign of beauty and joy mm. with uh, the phlox plant, I believe, that's super bright pink. And that's referred to as a pink moon, that first spring moon. So there's no indication that he would know that. Most likely he was talking about like an eclipse or something that, you know, kind of a wash yeah. of, of red. But I believe that dichotomy, that what it really represents and what he was utilizing it for is still makes that double tragic yeah. that he was trying to communicate something. You, you, you take a lot of the lyrics on this record are kind of super simple, mm -hmm. very, uh, very repeatable phrases over and over again. But uh, in the song road, you know, he says you could take a road to take you to the stars. I could take a road that'll see me through. Like he's very, like he is being cryptic and in no no, he cuts right to the chase. So, you know that I love you. You know I don't care. You know that I see you. You know I'm not there. Like, you can't be any more direct than what he's being, yeah. which I think, I mean, it's awful to uh, read about his uh, decline over years. So, after we recorded Pink Moon, people would see him at parties. He stopped washing his hair. He stopped clipping his fingernails. He was dirty. He was just, he'd show up and kind of, disappear into the corner, not communicate with anyone in this, this rapid decline of this genius who was unappreciated, like was destroying, you know, his friends couldn't, couldn't deal with it. Like I liken it a lot to, um, Sid Barrett from Pink Floyd, okay. like the original lead singer of Pink Floyd, who, you know, got super strung out on acid and he was this genius, you know, he was the piper at the gates of dawn. He was the, the piper of Pink Floyd for the first two records and he had all these great ideas, Interstellar Overdrive and all these things were were him and he destroyed his brain that was probably already super susceptible to that kind of thing. Just like Nick's was, the drugs accelerated it a little bit and kind of opened it up and then fell out of favor. What what Sid Barrett had in in his corner is that Pink Floyd sold massive amounts of records. Yeah. And was able to sustain him until he passed away quietly in 2008 or 9 at 50 or 60 years old. And he had he had just kind of disappeared. Yeah. But they had similar storylines about this genius thing. One was appreciated. One was clearly not. What are you reading over there? Kyle? I'm reading about the uh, the end. I guess if that's where we want to go next. Sure. So obviously Pink Moon came out 1972. And uh, after that, like you said, he, he moved back in with his parents and he was super depressed. And uh, I guess he was he was living on a, his only income at the time was a 20 pound a week retainer he received from Island Records, which is uh, equivalent to 238 pounds in 2018 dollars. Mm. So not a whole lot not to a lot. live on. Um, he'd literally just disappear for days and, you know, show up at a friend's house and be like, can I sleep on your couch for a few days? Oh, of course. Yeah, come on in, Nick. And he'd sleep on somebody's couch and then he'd just be gone in the middle of the night and wouldn't show up. Nobody would know where he went for months. He used to borrow his parents' car yeah, and, I just, read that. and drive until it just ran out of gas and then call him and be like, hey, can somebody come and get me? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> he's clearly running. Yeah. With no place to go. Like that's, that's clearly what's happening. Uh, John Martin, who uh, wrote the song Solid Air about Drake in 1973, described Drake in this period as the most withdrawn person he had ever met. Yep. That makes sense. Yeah. And I didn't realize there was another song about him besides uh, Life in a Northern Town, which was a, everybody knows that yeah. song. I didn't realize that was about him until doing yeah. the research for this. I had known that for a while, <laughs> yet I didn't make the connection growing up. Like I had, I had heard that it was like an elegy to, to Nick Drake when I was probably 15 or 16. And I'm like, I don't know who Nick Drake is and it doesn't matter. But yeah, but it's a, it's a fine song. But looking back on it now, you're like, okay. You make those connections about how that song sounds, that Northern British sound. It's very much in uh, who he was. And still, like, like you realize how appreciated that record is now. So Rolling Stone has it at number 321 of the top 500 albums of all time. Wow. And how many people have realistically heard this record? Like, it's, it's very slim. Yeah. So it, it has made an impact, but maybe is still not to the level that it could have had he had been appreciated in that time. Um, my friend wrote uh, very specifically, Chris wrote, it's an unkind destiny that the scope of Nick's, Nick Drake's artistry wasn't really discovered until after he died, that he wouldn't sell many records for a good 25 years. It took the slow death of rock and roll music, the spectacle and bombast to burn out before we could all discover his voice. We needed that voice to heal the trauma inflicted by Vietnam Watergate and the threat of nuclear war hanging over our heads before the end of the world came in the year 2000. The world's still ending and Pink Moon's still on its way. But I love spending 28 min minutes hidden away in the world of Nick Drake's voice and hypnotic strum. Again, that speaks volumes to what that record represented. I mean, the, what, the longest track on the record is three and a half minutes. I think so, yeah. But there are plenty of minute 50 yeah songs on it that it was so direct speaking to you know to you very specifically this was another thing i didn't know uh in uh, february 1973 he actually went back to start recording for a fourth album right in the middle of this horrible depressing period yeah we only recorded what four songs i think yeah so one of them that he recorded was called black eyed dog which uh, the title was inspired by winston churchill's description taken from samuel johnson of depression is a black-eyed dog which i thought was very interesting because i mean a lot of times when people are depressed like that they don't they know it but they don't outwardly give you indicators like that and it i feel like he was starting to just be like look what else do i have to do here right like, exactly uh they uh they started recording i can't remember the name of the studio now but they ended up moving back to a uh, sound technique studio uh, which raised Drake's spirits apparently. And his mother recalled, uh, we were so absolutely thrilled to think that Nick was happy because there hadn't been any happiness in Nick's life for years. So if someone's very ill medically, there's typically a, a rallying period where all of a sudden they're sick, they're sick, they're sick, and they seem really, really good. Yeah. And then, and then they go. And that's what I feel like that was that end where... He's been miserable and depressed for years, and all of a sudden, he may have had a plan. He yeah. may have seen what he what he was going to do, and he had just kind of made peace with it. I mean, maybe he's joyful because he knows, hey, it, it'll be over soon anyway, so what's the yeah. difference? And you know the story, you know, he was on antidepressants, and antidepressants in, I can imagine, antidepressants in 1972 oh, are Lord. a far cry from what antidepressants are in 2019. Yeah. Uh, he was on, uh, I wrote it down, uh, amyl triptyline. I'm glad you can pronounce that because I can't. I guarantee he's probably taken several of those. It's not like he's curbing how much weed or hash he's smoking. So what are those two things combined doing to his, his already fragile, fractured psyche? Like he's living with his parents, you know, he's expressed himself through art that he believes is important and valuable and been shunned and kind of unrecognized for doing that. You go live with your parents, you go, you move back to your childhood home, essentially, you're taking antidepressants, you're smoking weed, yeah. you're I mean, you're seeing a collision course here. So uh, what does last morning, you've read this, right? Yeah. You know, wandered out of his bedroom 
which he apparently did pretty frequently. Right. Made early. himself like a bowl of cereal or whatever, wandered back to his bedroom and went back to bed, and his mom found him the next day with... Oh, have you read the quote that she she said about finding him? It's so... It was something about his... All she saw was his, his long His mother legs. later said, I never used to disturb him at all, yeah. uh, but it was about 12 o'clock and I went in because really it seemed it was time he got up. And he was lying across the bed. The first thing I saw was his long, long legs. Mm -hmm. It's a lot to unpack there. So specifically, they should never, no parents should ever find their child like that. But yeah, that's horrible. Right? But there has to be some measure. If, if you're that close to your child and you know what, that, what your child is going through, uh, through all that, there almost has to be a measure of relief that that pain is relieved. Because there's, there's no way... She didn't know what a desperate state this was. Yeah, There's a quote that fits pretty good here. Rodney, his father, Rodney Drake, mm -hmm. uh, described his son's death as unexpected and extraordinary. Uh, however, in a 1979 interview, which was several years later, um, he said he had been worried about Nick being so depressed. They used to hide away the aspirin and pills and things like that. Yeah. So I mean, they, they knew. They're aware. Right. Is, and his sister, you know, that. It, the coroner ru ruled it a suicide. Yeah. Right. And there's been speculation for years that it was an accidental overdose. You know, his sister said that she thinks she hopes that it was purposeful. Yeah. She hopes that, that it wouldn't occur by accident, that he just, he probably had a handful of pills and said, I'm going to take them and either I wake up or I don't wake up. And that's kind of the bargain there. Yeah. Which is bleak. <laughs> yeah. But. Clearly, he was not well. Yeah. Right. And it, you know, you can hear all about your, uh, you know, the 27 curse, you know, Hendricks and Joplin and Morrison and all these people that are, that did themselves in way more intentionally. But this man was troubled. Yeah. Was sick. And through that makes this beautiful record, this haunting piece of melody that uh, still absolutely adored to this day. Like, it's fantastic. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, uh, his funeral services were took place on December 2nd, 1974, and he was cremated, but his ashes were buried under an oak tree in the church's graveyard. Um, later, his parents' ashes were both buried under the same uh, gravestone and oak tree in the graveyard. Uh, and the grave where Drake's ashes are buried uh, is inscribed with the epitaph, uh, Now we rise and we are everywhere. Which are taken from the lyrics from, from, the, from morning. the morning, which is the final song on Pink Moon. Which couldn't be any more prophetic right? than that. I said prophetic, not pathetic. Prophetic. Pro prophetic. But I think in all this sadness, there is some really good news. Because after he was gone, people actually started to find him. There was mm -hmm. a retrospective album Fruit called Tree? Fruit Tree in 1979, which uh, started to kind of put him back on people's radar and it was, you know, I mean, it was the beginning of the eighties. It was the beginning of, uh, you know, all kinds of new musical growth for people. And I'm sure there's hundreds of artists that he's influenced, but the three that really stick out, um, Robert Smith from the cure, yep. obviously huge influence. And you can hear it when you listen to their music. Uh, David Silverman from the, uh, group Japan. Interesting. Um, he actually wrote a really nice, I didn't quote anything from it, but he wrote a very nice, uh, thing that you can find online talking about how Nick Drake influenced him. Uh, and, uh, Peter Buck from REM. That one's not a surprise. <laughs> that one's not a surprise to most people. Yeah. He, he made it very public that he was influenced, but. So he did have an impact. The only unfortunate thing is he's. He was never aware of the impact that he had yeah. and didn't have it at the time that could have bolstered his mental state, which is, yeah. uh, that's too bad. Have you seen, um, the uh, biography was written in 1997 about him. Uh, and then a documentary was made in 1998 called a stranger among us. Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? I have not seen it. I haven't either. And I couldn't find it anywhere. I didn't really yeah. dig deep, but it was, it didn't come up when I started searching for everybody it, out so. there listening should, uh, somehow track it down and if you do track it down send us a link to Please. where you tracked it down so we can watch it because that's a big deal and it's a it's such a magical record and it's one of my favorites and you know i love acoustic guitar music there are better players than him 
there are better singers than him. But the combination of those two and how this record was recorded so nakedly yeah. that it was it, it's a uh, it's perfect for the time and everybody should listen to it. Am I going to get a little preachy here? Do you want me to get out like the the pulpit so you can stand up on top of it? Could you? Yeah, no problem. You, Let me just. Do we have one? We do. Is it, is it over here? We just okay. drag it out here. Just drag it. Uh, listen, we all we all go through some shit. So every one of us is uh, experienced. I guarantee you out there, everyone has experienced periods of depression, melancholy, whatever you want to call it, troubling times. And just you, you guys have to know, you go through periods like that. We all do. Find somebody to talk to. Find someone to communicate with, whether that's uh, a family member or your friends or whatever. There are people that will listen. That it could be us. We'll listen. There's always people to talk to, and you know we've come a long way since 1972 and in, in how we handle mental illness and stuff like that. That you have places to go, you have people to talk to. But if it's ever so desperate that you're past that communication point with family, with friends, with people that you trust, you know there are ways. There's a hotline, a National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which is a one eight hundred. 273 8255. It's 273 talk. Is that what it is? Yeah. The numbers are correct that you had. It is 1 800 273 talk. Or you can go to their website, which is uh, suicidepreventionlifeline.org. There you go. This is the second podcast we've had to put a suicide prevention (laughs) plug into. It's 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 kind of who we are. Yeah. uh, Yeah. But That's, that's good, though. And definitely please do. I mean, even if you're just just a hint of it. Yeah. Call and talk to somebody, you know, text a friend, uh, you know, chat somebody up online, chat somebody up in a bar, you right. know, whatever, do something, reach out. And, and there are people that love you and there are people that want to help. Right. You. And who will listen. And if you're listening to this going, God, damn, those guys really suck. <laughs> reach out and tell us that we suck. Tell us that we suck and we can start a conversation and maybe we can help you through whatever you're battling. And like, we're willing to listen. We're willing to talk to you or, or at least get you in touch with people that can help you. Maybe we can't. So, and you if, know, if this podcast is making you contemplate suicide, we I'm, apologize. There's not much we can do about I that. Can't, one, but uh, I can't help you there. The next one might be the next episode might be a little more upbeat. So it could be, could be, who knows? It could be, but we're covering, we, we're going to be covering uh death music, the right? dirges of the funeral. No, I'm just kidding. It's a, uh, it's a 45 uh, minute to an hour and a half discussion about Slayer and all things <laughs> related to it. No. Uh, but seriously, like Pink Moon, is a, it, it's a fantastic record. And if you put it in context of what this person was going through, it's, it's a heavy weight. It's, it's a burden. But if you, if you put that aside, it is a, a wonderfully beautiful record that stands the test of time can be listened to in any era and it uh, speaks to me personally as a haunting beautiful melodic record i cannot put it in better words than that it is wonderful and very sad it is yes but uh yeah i guess that that that's it please do get in touch with us though uh, you can email us info at uh, audiojudo.com contact us through facebook facebook.com forward slash audiojudo uh, Twitter at Audio Judo, hmm. uh, all of those things. Yeah, pretty much anywhere uh, online. If you search for Audio Judo, we're one of the top couple things that comes up, and yep. everything else is a, a Judo podcast. So <laughs> if you accidentally click on that, yeah, you might re- learn something new. Right, reach out and uh, send us some garbage. We like to read garbage. <laughs> we do enjoy reading garbage. Please so, feel free to tell us we suck as well, yes. or if you have any great ideas, tell us what you want to hear. Because we're always trying to make it. We want you guys to enjoy this podcast. Anybody who wants to listen, we want you to enjoy it. And the only way that we know that you are enjoying it is if we get some feedback from you. Absolutely. Please do. So thanks again for listening to Audio Judo. We will see you next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. You know what we're going to talk about next time? Nuclear. Okay.